Good evening. It is Monday, July 12th, 2021, 5 p.m., and I'd like to call this Committee of the Whole, the Lansing City Council, to order um, and ask that the clerk please call the roll. Councilmember Spadafore? Present. Participating in the building. Councilmember Hussain? <laughs> Present. Councilmember Wood? Present. Councilmember Spitzley? Councilmember Dunbar? Present. Councilmember Jackson? Present. Councilmember Garza? Present. Councilmember Betts? Present. Seven members present. Thank you. There's a quorum present. Uh, first item of business are the minutes from June 21st, 2021. Mr. Vice President. Sure. I would move the meeting minutes as presented. The minutes have been moved. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Didn't that feel good? All right. Uh, next up is public comment on our agenda items. Uh, those wishing to make public comment, please drop your comment cards in the in the bin. Uh, we will do it, though, uh, first come, first serve. Uh, those are just for the record. So um, you have three minutes to speak, and you may address us from the microphone. And we ask that you keep your comments to the items on the agenda this evening. Jim, go for it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, from July to July, the Bureau Audio Evaluation Agency has been conducting a regular public review of the They, what you have before you tonight are resolutions that are succinct, easy to understand, and legally solid. So thank you very much. I want to make one thing clear, not so much to the council, but to members of the public. What is under discussion tonight is not should the city of Lansing do ranked choice voting, yes or no. What's under discussion tonight is, is there reason to put on the November ballot a charter change that would bring ranked choice voting to the city of Lansing. If you put this on the November ballot, I'll be voting yes. Uh, but not everybody will. And, and that's not the important thing. Whether or not you are for ranked choice voting, surely you can't be against putting it on the ballot and letting the voters of Lansing decide. When ranked choice voting was on the ballot in the city of New York, it passed by 73.5%. That's a lot, but it means that 26.5% of the people were either against it or they didn't understand how positive, what a positive change it could be. If placed on the ballot in November, I and others will right away get to work educating the public on ranked choice voting advocating for ranked choice voting. I'm asking council tonight to pass these unanimously. The voters of Lansing can be trusted. Please let the voters of Lansing decide whether ranked choice voting is right or not for this city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeLine. Any others wishing to address the committee? Seeing none, we'll move on. Next item on our agenda is a presentation from the Lansing Board of Water Light. It's the fiscal year ending 630-2022 budget, budget and capital forecast for FYS 22 through 27 with Dick Peffley and Heather Shawa. And I see Scott Taylor on the agenda, but I think Scott's going to stay in the audience. All right. Dick, Heather, welcome. Uh, you're our first presentation in the new Brave New World. Thank you, and uh, good evening, council members. And we are here tonight to do a brief presentation on the FY22 BWL O&M uh, and six-year capital budget, uh, which was submitted as required by city charter. Uh, as uh, council president stated, uh, Heather Shawa, the CFO of the Board of Wine Ladies here, and also Scott Taylor, manager of finance, is here. Uh, and I'm Dick Peffley, general manager of the Board of Water and Light. Uh, before we go into the brief presentation, there is a couple highlights I'd like to point out to you is that uh, we had an approved rate hike for all utilities last year. We did suspend that um, due to COVID and we also had a forecasted hike for this year, rate increase, and I also uh, requested 
uh, the commissioners uh, consider waiving that which they have. So we ha haven't had a rate hike for last or this year, but we're still able to maintain the service uh, quality that our customers have come to expect. Second, one thing that is uh, very important to us is I know that everybody remembers how the Board of Iron Light was the second utility in the company to remove lead service uh, pipes. We're embarking on a new adventure. We have uh, 800 miles of water pipe in the city of Lansing. And the pipe has about a 100 year life. So we should be replacing eight miles a year so that we can replace our entire infrastructure. Historically, we've replaced between one and two miles. So we're not catching up. So for the first time, we have an approved budget and a funding mechanism to replace the entire water system in the city of Lansing. We will start ramping up over the next few years to replace eight miles of pipe a year so that we are on a schedule so that we have completely replaced the TND system and uh, will help us back off on um, or eliminate all the main breaks that we have and any kind of water quality issues. That's a long-term program, but if you look around the country and try to find another water utility that has a funded replacement for its entire TND system, it'd be hard to find one. We have one. Uh, We'll ramp up uh, this year a little bit, and then with, within the six-year forecast, we'll be to eight miles of pipe. It is my intention and hope uh, to have Board of Wire Light staff do that, but there, that's a big hurdle, uh, and we got four years or so to get workforce modifications and uh, work rules and employees. Uh, we don't have enough employees right now to do that kind of work, but we'll be looking at doing that. So those are... Uh, in this year's uh, budget kicked off, and you'll see our water uh, T&D budget uh, is ramped up to about $15 million a year, but uh, a lot of work to get there, but uh, it's been probably 20 years of trying to get there, and this budget accomplishes that and funds it into the future so that we can replace the eight miles that we need to do. So uh, it's very good news. I will turn that over to Heather um, for the presentation. Thank you, General Manager Pepley. Good evening. It's nice to be here in person. Um, a couple highlights. Um, in the packet that was sent over, um, we did have our fiscal 22 operating um, budget and cash flow, as well as our six-year capital forecast. So it um, shows our current fiscal year 22, and then I'll highlight um, the six-year forecast on our capital. So um, a few highlights is General Manager Pepley stated no rate increases. Um, we had one initially forecasted for fiscal 22. However, we were able to defer that. Um, this does delay, however, our multi-year strategy to reach our targeted rate um, of return, which is important and required to continue to maintain and replace our infrastructure as needed. Um, however, initially, the, uh, we were meeting that target uh, 2024 in the prior forecast. This current forecast um, does get us back to achieving that um, with a two-year delay, uh, 2026. Um, we also benefit from deferring the rate increases. We are focusing on a rate strategy um, that we are um, planning to implement to um, work on our competitiveness and make sure that, um, especially for our business, our CNI customers, um, so that also deferring the rate increase and looking at efficiencies internally um, allows us to um, help attract businesses to our area. Um, this budget supports our new strategic plan, which our Board of Commissioners adopted this past January. Um, so all the major initiatives that are either ongoing um, and still underway to be implemented and new ones, um, our budget does support that over the six-year forecast. It also supports key financial metrics, um, including our required days cash on hand, our debt service coverage. Um, it keeps us compliant with our bond covenants um, and keeps helps keep our uh, borrowing costs down with our um, above average or above benchmark um, rating uh, affirmation that we have been recently received from our rating agencies. Um, a few details specific to fiscal 22. Our revenue budgeted is uh, just over $392 million. Our total operating income, um, $52.3 million, and a net income of about $568,000 for fiscal 22. Again, while that doesn't get us to our uh, targeted rate of return, which is currently 4.2%, we get halfway there, and then also as um, 
discussed by the end of the forecast period, we do meet with all utilities um, the targeted rate of return at 4.2%. Moving on to the capital forecast, oh, before I move on to that, on the income statement that was provided, um, we also, you'll see a line item um, that shows the um, return on equity payment um, to the city as well. So that's um, line item on the income statement. Our fiscal 22 capital budget is a strong uh, $73 million for fiscal 22. Um, the slide in the packet um, that was provided shows it by utility, broken down by utility and location. Our six year forecast is $441 million of capital. And this is all funded with, um, with operating um, cash flows. That concludes my, um, my highlights and, and brief overview. I'm happy to take any questions. Sure, I have a real quick question before I move to Council Member Wood. Um, there's 2027, there's accurate capital improvement. Is that just shutting that down? What's that um, CIP? I can, I'll, I'll take it. Um, it is both. So there is um, securing the property with the generating unit being um, being down. However, we still have a switch yard. Oh. Um, so the T&D um, part of that location still needs to be um, maintained. Thank you. Council Member Wood. Uh, thank you. With the deferment of uh, the rate hikes for um, the two years, is the plan then to gradually integrate those in or is it going to jump? Okay. No, no, a great question. Thank you for, um, for asking that. Um, we did have some efficiencies and cost improvements. Um, we did have, due to COVID, some um, cost deferrals. So we were able to defer the rate increase for fiscal 22 um, without adding additional increases over the forecast period. So we, our goal is to stay um, at or under inflation with our, our rate increases. One key to that, Council Member Wood, is that typically if we have a half a million in uncollected debt, you know, and I'm jumping I was up and going down. There next, you and it's 11 million right now. So we're what is it? 11 million. 11 million. So it's typically a half a million is where we like to be, uh, and we're going to uh, we're working with our customers to start collecting, but rate increases are you know are under or at inflation, as Heather said but it means that we have to collect some of the debt that's owed us. And so we're working with our customers to do that uh, right now, but it's uh, at an unprecedented level. Okay. And then um, the uh, water pipe replacement, how much of the piping is in the right of way versus the street? The majority of the piping is in the street. So is part of replacement as you're looking um, at replacing the water um, pipeline, is it to also resurface the street? How, how have you looked at, at this? Is it a patchwork type of thing? What are, what are your intentions on this? Our intentions are we have a very good relationship with uh, the uh, public service group and they dictate to us, um, we have buy-in of course, of how much the lane needs to be replaced. Uh, it's based on, there's a pacer level determining how much it costs and then we look at uh, the width and how much alligator is already in the street and sometimes it's the entire lane, some, sometimes it's more than that because uh, we, we have to go both ways uh, across the street. Uh, say we're going down a, um, the passenger lane that you drive in, we go to the houses on the right, but we have to go across to the houses on the left a lot of times if we're going to collect a service, then a lot of times this is a complete uh, road resurfacing. But it is on a case by case, and we aren't even to that level yet. This was a huge effort just to get the funding. Uh, we haven't determined. Uh, you know, how many employees this will take, can we do it in-house, can, you know, is there gonna be some assistance, how we work with the city, because uh, that, that's eight miles of road tour up in the city, you know, what, what is the, the construction schedule? So the first part was the hurdle of getting the money. And that we have a funding source now, so now it's kinda, they asked me for the money, Heather got the money, now operations is taking over to determine uh, what they need to do. And that's why it's a three year ramp up. You know, this year is still at the typical two, two miles. We get to eight miles in four years. At the, end, at the end of fiscal 26. At the end of fiscal 26. So we have a lot of planning, a lot of working, uh, a lot of 
uh, with different organizations to make sure we can get there. Now, we, we know we can. Uh, money was the hurdle in my mind. Um, so th there'll be a lot of work going forward with different departments in the city as well as our customers determine how we do that. We do have a, an idea of where we want to start because we know where we have the most problematic mains in town and things like that. So um, once we got the funding approved, and this has just happened recently, we'll start now working with the different departments. Um, that are, you know, and MDOT has, you know, we have to work with them. There's you know, certain trunk lines where you go across. So, uh, But we have the uh, internal expertise to put this project together from a management standpoint. Well, of course, you're going to hear from me that I hope that you work seriously with the Public Service Department when we look at the amount of dollars that we have for roads, this yep. is a way to um, enhance that and be able, if you're doing one side of the street and we can do the other, that would, you know, lessen what our cost would be um, for that. And, and if there's areas um, where the road is worse, that might be an area too where you might be able to come in and, and do your replacements if that works as, as well so uh, mark you're listening as i'm okay yep no we fully understand and we actually are going to try to not try but i've told them to reach out to other utilities are you going to be digging in this in any time soon because we're not in any hurry to hit a spot if consumers energy is going to dig up road x and we're right next to the road over then maybe we move over when they do it so that we minimize the construction sometimes that coordination the coordination between the border and the city is very good but sometimes other entities, you know, they don't tell you what they're up to and, you know, we end up doing things twice. And that's what we're trying to get away from, uh, you know, to reach with other utilities, uh, you know, other underground providers, a lot, of, um, lot of, a lot of things under the street. So that's our intent as we move forward, try to get better at coordinating with everybody so the road's open one time. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilmember Jackson. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for being here. You're uh, welcome. I just want to thank the Board Water and Light for working with people during the last year or so. I know a lot of people personally and in the city and everywhere that benefited from that. So I appreciate that. I know it puts you at a disadvantage for collection and everything as well. And thank you for working with the people at Morris Park to get the lighting fixed. Calvin Jones helped out on that a lot. Um, more lighting, LED, it was great. Everybody's so far happy. So thanks for working with us. You're welcome. Um, so the other part is, you know, I remember a lot of the public comment, mm -hmm. you know, in the last four years or so, and the priorities and the workshops, which is, you know, the inputs taken and it was projected into the five-year plan or however long it is, five-year, six? Six. Six. Yes, sir. Um, so I guess I see other down here for like location and projects in the six-year plan is like 16 million out of 118 million. I guess, is there anything in the budget that reflects the efforts for the thumb area project that's kind of being, that's a little bit, has challenges? Um, and then does it like reflect any other ideas towards you know, renewable energy. Yeah, could you tell me what the Thumb Area project um, is? Isn't there a wind farm that's or a solar? Oh yes, that's like yes. We're hopeful for, but no, that's up and running. We've been getting energy from that uh, for probably eight months now. That's yeah, the Thumb, yeah, what, uh, Huron County. Are we gonna maybe develop a? Area. The, we have that is our uh, the bulk of that energy is border wire light energy coming from uh, from that farm up there um, out of the. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but out of the 120 or 30 megawatts, uh, 70 of the megawatts are at Board of Water and Light. Uh, uh, all that power uh, from those, those 70 megawatts comes back to Board of Water and Light customers. Okay, so just two follow-ups. So I do recall, and it was only like, I swear, like less than two years ago, there was like a project that was stuck in township litigation. That's the project. And it's already we're receiving energy from yes yeah it's uh was delayed by two years uh because of litigation uh you know for certain you know some people don't want to windmill in their backyard and uh next era uh is the company that built it for us and they're the largest renewable wind manufacturer in the world and they started in tuscola county uh went through site planning permitting uh and uh it got uh then it was stopped 
and so they moved to Tuscola County, and they did it again. In fact, it was $70 million in the ground, and the project got stopped, but we went through the court proceedings, uh, prevailed. Uh, the project was built slightly smaller. The bore on light got a, a slightly less than what we were anticipating, but we didn't have to pay for it. And so that's been online, s I think, seven months now. So we are getting our f uh, energy from there. That's a great report. Um, what's the name of that? I just don't see it on here. Pegasus. It's which one? It's Pegasus. Now, it wouldn't be on there because it's called a purchase power agreement. We don't own it because we can't get tax credits. So it doesn't pay for us to own it. Now, the energy is ours. It can't be, go to anybody else. So we partner with private developers, like our solar farm in Dela Township, which is still the largest tracking solar uh, farm in the state. It's owned by Consumers Energy because they get a 30% tax credit for building it. We split that, and our customers save. Now, people say, you know, it's not yours. It is ours. Uh, it's got our name on it. But, the, you know, technically, the ownership is Consumers Energy. They can't sell the energy to anybody else. It's 100% ours. The wind farm is the same way, as well as one of the largest solar arrays going in uh, in Chiawassee County, that we are the um, majority owner in that when it comes to getting the purchase power from that. Okay, that's a great That's about a year, uh, a a year away from going commercial. And then I guess my last question is, so if there's any expansion or anything new in the next six years, it would, as of now, unless there's some amendment, it would come from that other um, at the bottom? Yeah. Yes. If there's any, um, if there's any um, feasibility studies um, looking at microgrids and, and some of that newer technology, um, we do have money set aside for that, and you're correct, it would be in the common or other. Um, also, a big ticket item in, in that line item is um, software implementation and development. So we still have our smart grid initiatives, um, be smart projects that we're finishing up. So some of that is technology improvements also. Thank you. One last. Uh, we're also embarking right now, um, I don't know if the RFP is out, on battery technology to start uh, looking into that. Uh, so we have that, and we have a lot of funding set aside to start putting charging stations up around town for uh, the electrical ve electric vehicles that are coming uh, into the Lansing area. Thank you for that information. You're welcome. Anyone else? Vice President Hussein? Just really quickly, I was actually just going to give an affirmation, but I wanted to to underscore the importance of, and I, I believe the sincerity, I can feel the sincerity in terms of communicating with um, public services, but it's, it's not just, um, it, it certainly is about um, financial cost effectiveness, that type of thing, but it's also about ensuring that your residential uh, customers and your commercial customers, um, that their lives aren't disrupted or their businesses aren't disrupted unduly over a certain period of time. I know um, we've had, you know, in my time on council, we've had a few projects uh, come through the southwest end of the city, really disrupt whether that be minor, major arteries, uh, you know, that uh, folks use to get to uh, businesses yep. um, on, on mi minor arteries like Pleasant Grove and, and West Holmes, um, only to have the city come through the next maybe year or maybe even over the next two construction seasons. And it really, I mean, that can really be the death knell for a small business that's operating on just, I mean, razor thin profit margins. So I truly appreciate you guys uh, communicating, coordinating with one another um, and ensuring that when possible, we're, we're kind of moving the dirt, so to speak, once. Uh, so thank you. Uh, the other piece is I wanted to thank um, you. I wanted to thank, I see Kelvin Jones in the audience, uh, as well as Brina. I know as council members, we, we call on you guys often. Um, yeah. and, and you guys over communicate. You're very, very responsive. Uh, even when, uh, even when you know, the answers that we receive or, or your um, rate payers receive aren't necessarily what we or they want to hear, uh, you guys always go direct. We appreciate that. And I think that's really the strength of hometown power. So thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Preffley, I have one quick question for you. You spoke about expanding infrastructure for electric vehicles and things like that. Will you be implementing off-peak rates for that type of uh, electric electricity use? We will, um, and we've got some technology that's just about done. It's part of our smart meter AMI and uh, our new billing system. We needed to have that in place uh, before we could do uh, what we call off-peak uh, billing. Our intention is uh, to... Uh, save our customers money um, by giving them a lower rate at night. We're not going to increase the rate during the day. We're going to lower it at night with commissioner. I'll have to I'll make a recommendation sure. to my commissioners because they're in charge of rate making and say that if you uh, charge your car at night, run your electric, vi or run, your, like, run your dishwasher, your washing machine, we will uh, give you uh, a break in your energy uh, cost to encourage them to help shave the peak 
uh, that's uh, seen during the day on some of these hot days. So we will be doing that. And uh, yeah. an X-ray strategy uh, this time next year. Okay. This time next year. This time next year. Okay. Yep. And uh, part of that, we'll be looking at. Uh, some on bill financing and things like that too. Some, yeah, <laughs> Heather's cringed at me. We'll be looking at other options that will help, like our, <laughs> that will help our customers, uh, you know, live and grow a better lifestyle in Lansing in my mind. Great, so I can start drying my hair at night then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I see, no, oh, one more question from Councilmember Garza. All right, thank you, Council President. Thanks for being here, you guys. Um, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, it's good to see you guys in person again. But just one quick question. When you brought up the, the charging stations, mm -hmm. will the renewable energies be enough to support all the different charging stations, or will those still come off of the power plant, the new power plant? It'll be a combination of both. Right now, uh, we, we've, we can, our gross generation is close to 500 megawatts, and we have about 220 megawatts of renewable, so by percentage. Now, the base generation is available 98% of the time where the renewables vary between, you know, solar's at 18% and wind's a little higher than that. So um, depending when you're using a charging station, you could be getting more renewables than uh, base load. Uh, you know, if, the, if it's windy and sunny out, that half of it would be coming from uh, renewables. And, you know, if it's at night, there'll be less coming from solar. But that portfolio, uh, we continue to grow that. We, we need to grow it at a rate that doesn't negatively impact the customers. It's a balancing rate. Uh, we we want to maintain a double digit uh, re rate re lower than our nearest competitor for our residential and we, we typically are there so we, we grow uh, at that rate right now but we we can supply any customer uh, in our service territory with 100% renewable energy today just call us up or log on to Greenwise program it's a 10% premium you get about 15% right now in your base rate but if you want to uh, move up to 100%. If your light bill is $100, it's going to go to 110 and then we guarantee that 100% of your energy is renewable, and we can do that for anybody. And if you sign up and three months later you decide for some reason you, you know you got to get out of the program, you can do that too. There's no lock-in on it anymore. Great. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. It's nice to see you in person. Yeah, you as well, Mr. Pepley. Uh, while they are situating, our next presentation comes from the Capital Area District Library, and I'd like to invite the folks up from Capital Area, from CADL. Jerry's throwing pens at me. Yeah. Scott, I welcome back to City City Council. And then I could have Melissa. Welcome, Melissa. Said to make sure I was not on mute still. So yeah, you're off mute. Very good. Um, my name is Scott Dimesha. I'm the executive director of Capital Area District Libraries, and I'm joined by Melissa Cole. She is the head librarian at our downtown Lansing branch, our South Lansing branch, and our Foster branch. So she is a very, very busy person. And also, I'm joined by one of our board members, Deborah Boomquist. Uh, and we are here tonight to normally we come here uh, every year and, and give you an update on our annual report. And while no one wants to go back and relive anything that, that occurred in 2020, when we as a library system actually took a pause and, and looked back and reflected on what we were able to accomplish in 2020, um, it was surprising. Uh, I, I know a lot of us, when we were going through that year, we kind of put our heads down and it was difficult to kind of take a big picture approach and see the impact that you make on your community. But one of the things that, that we had to work with being a public service organization and not having the public in your space, what did that mean for library service for our communities as well too? So I'm just gonna kind of hit some of the high points and then Melissa's gonna talk specifically about the, uh, the three Lansing branches. And so when we met, went in early on in 2020 and looked at what library service meant for our communities, we had to look at how will people access our collections? How will people access technology? And then also, how will people access our communities through the library as well, too? So Melissa will go kind of into finer detail in our collections, uh, but we were able to do that um, quite effectively. So we had to move to a similar to retail to a curb and door side pickup model. With that model, we were still able to circulate 1.6 million items uh, in the year 2020. So normally, it's just over 2 million items, so it's not that big of a drop off from where we were kind of pre-pandemic years as well, too. 
And when the stay home, stay, stay safe order was in place, all of our staff were working from home and we had to really push our digital collections. And luckily we were a library system that heavily invested in digital collections. So these are eBooks, audiobooks, streaming movies and music. And so we had a pretty robust collection in place and that circulated just over 700,000 items uh, in 2020. Probably one of the largest circulations of any public library system uh, in the state of Michigan as well too. So we were able to meet that demand and, and as you'll see um, in our annual report, it's in your packet starting on page 13. What we did is we took a lot of personal stories from our users uh, throughout the year as well too. Um, when people came in to pick up their items, uh, we just decided to get brown grocery bags and those brown grocery bags kind of turned into a thing. Um, we heard from a number of parents that when they brought those brown bags home, it was like Christmas uh, coming to their, their family when they, because when they, it was a surprise for their kids bringing back the, the library items. But it wasn't just access to our materials. We knew that our communities needed access to technology as well too. So one thing that we saw during the pandemic, which every community saw, was that uh, access to broadband internet wasn't a nice to have, it was a necessity. Uh, and when people were not coming into our spaces, they were using the Wi-Fi outside of our spaces as a way to connect, whether it was for schooling, whether it was for work, whether it was to apply for a job, whether it was to apply for benefits, they needed access to the internet. So one thing that we did when we came back into our spaces uh, back in June was we already had uh, hot spots that we loaned out. We applied for federal grant funding to purchase more of those hot spots as well too. So we had just under 200 hot spots that we were circulating out. We circulated ones that were on the Verizon network, that were on Sprint, and that they were on T-Mobile, so that people knew when they brought these hotspots home that they were gonna work in their homes as well, too. They also were not capped by data, so you didn't have to worry about when you brought it home if, if you had your whole family using it, or if you had your, your students using it, or you, you were using it for work, you weren't gonna be cut off at any time as well, too. And when we look at access to technology as a library system, we don't just look at it as access to broadband internet. We know that there's more to it than that. So we describe our approach to access to technology and the digital divide as a three-legged stool. One leg of that stool is access to the internet. The other two legs are access to devices and the training on how to use those devices as well. And that was no more apparent than, than when we talked to a lot of students. And, and one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning is when we closed the year of 2020, we had the most library cards that we've ever had uh, as a library system. And, and part of that was we were able to work with the Ingham ISD school districts in our area and get each student a library card through what we call the Student Success Initiative. That's where they didn't have to come into our space, they could just use a student name or student number and be able to get library materials and check out library materials as well too. But in talking to those students, we heard from them that uh, access to the internet was nice, but they didn't have the devices to use once they got back home. And the reason for that is if they got staff, or if they got school issued devices, they had to give them back at the end of the year. And so uh, what we did is normally we, during the summertime, we have our summer reading challenge. Uh, we bring performers in to, to entertain um, kids and teens. We didn't do that in 2020. But what we did is we took the money that we would normally pay for that we bought devices. And uh, we put out a, a contest that if you completed the summer reading challenge, which is reading for 900 minutes or more throughout the summer, uh, and you wrote us an essay, then you could be entered to win one of these 35 devices that we purchased. So they were Chromebooks and they were iPads. Uh, we had over 100 responses and they were truly moving. And so I just wanted to briefly share um, one of the, the entries from that. She gave me permission to share this. She said, when the opportunity popped up via completing the summer reading program, I devoured the possibility. I started reading more so I be could become eligible for this contest. This possibility will help kids like me who dread falling behind. During the school year, we received school devices, but when school ended, we gave them back. I felt as if I would never catch up. Solely because of this contest, I feel as if there is some hope for me to catch up and even further advance my learning. During these programs, in your variety of books, I become a high-reaching student as well as a reader. And there's in, the, in our annual report, there, there's um, photos of some of the kids coming in and pick up their devices. Again, this was just one entry. All of the other ones were just as moving as well there too. So we saw an impact that, that we could make by getting devices distributed out to kids. But it wasn't just kids. It was, it was, it was adults trying to re-enter the workforce or just needed a device to work on from home as well too. So 
we applied for some federal funding through the CARES Act, and we were able to purchase Chromebooks and iPads to actually circulate out to uh, members of our community as well, too. And then uh, later in early fall of, of 2020, we were able to bring the public back into our space to use our public computers as well, too, and, and that made a huge impact as well. Um, but I, I talked about access to the internet, I talked about devices, and that third leg was um, training. And so uh, we are heavily looking forward to bringing back training at the Foster Community Center um, in the space that used to be um, ITEC, the Information Technology Empowerment Center. We are gonna bring those classes back. Obviously that was on pause um, from 2020. We were not able to do that, but I know Melissa and her staff are working towards bringing that back in late 2020 and or 2021 and continuing that in, in 2022. But it wasn't just technology programs. We also looked at small businesses and how we could help. And if you remember small businesses during the early part of COVID, there was those who had an e-commerce model and those who didn't have an e-commerce model. And the ones who didn't have an e-commerce model set up, their businesses were set up to fail. And so what we did is, again, we applied for another grant. This was through the American Library Association and uh, Grow with Google, which is Google's arm of getting out in the communities. And we were awarded this grant. And, and our grant was um, to help 50 small businesses set up an e-commerce site for themselves. And so we took the money. They, they, the money was intended um, to hire someone to lead these programs. But when we hire librarians, Melissa can verify this, we call them Swiss Army Knives. They can do everything. They can lead a story time. They can also teach an e-commerce course. And so these courses walked a small business through setting up a Shopify account so they could take payments and actually have their business set up online. And we had, uh, like I said, we helped over uh, 50 small businesses take part in this, this four-week course. And then we also, there was a waiting list, so we also offered another four-week course uh, later on in the year as well too. And so that training again wasn't just um, for students, it was for small businesses as well too. And for access to our communities, we work with several small or several community partners to be able to bring their services out in the community as well. We partnered with CATA so that we could uh, circulate CATA bus passes. We've heard fantastic feedback um, from our members that this is the way that they can actually afford to take pu public transportation by checking out with their library card. We also partnered with Potter Park Zoo so that you could check out zoo passes um, through our libraries as well too. But when we were looking at our members, we also saw there are some members that are being left behind and some members that were actually being blocked from using the library. And what I mean by that is we charged overdue fines for items if you brought them back late. Um, what our, our goal was act to actually get you to bring your items back in time. But when we were doing some of the research, we found that there were over 13,000 individuals that were essentially locked out of using the library because they accrued $10 or more in fines and they just stopped using their library card. And when we looked at the data, we mapped where those individuals lived along with the CDC's social vulnerability index and it was almost a perfect match. And this was throughout Ingham County uh, where this was happening. So uh, what we're doing this year, we planned for it in 2020, but what we're doing this year is we're going fine free. Um, we've already accounted for it in our budget um, and we found smarter ways that we can actually entice you to bring your items back on time without financially punishing you. And that's going forward, but what we've also done is waive the past fines on any of those individuals as well too. So, uh, we're going to start, you're going to start to see that more and more in the media as well too, but it, it's our way of re-engaging with individuals that, that maybe um, they didn't bring items back on time. It's not a problem anymore. You can, you can continue to start to re-engage with the library and use the library again as well too. So overall, there was a lot of information I shared, um, but it, it was once we, once we went back and looked on 2020, it truly was an engaging and moving year with us to go specifically more into details on Foster, South Lansing, and Downtown Lansing, person who does a lot of work, <laughs> Melissa Cole. Hello, everybody. Um, so uh, usually I come here and I talk about data and stats, but I mean, 2020 was a very unusual year, so I'm not gonna talk about our data or our stats for 2020. What I'm gonna talk about is what we did in the library, because it was, um, a hard year for our staff and it was a hard year for our patrons. Um, so we were able to provide limited service at the Lansing branches beginning in June. We had door service at South and Downtown and curbside at Foster. 
Um, we were happy to provide what service we could while taking great care for the safety of staff and patrons. Um, we offered print from anywhere at downtown and south. Uh, patrons could send prints from their devices and we could print them off and patrons could schedule a pickup. Uh, because browsing was not available, we provided grab and goes. Uh, patrons told us a few details about what they wanted and staff selected items that they may be interested in and it was very successful, especially with kids and that's kind of what Scott was referring to when he said it was like Christmas. It's like you, you get your bag and you don't know what's gonna be in it, so it's a, a big surprise. Um, uh, staff developed very creative take and make projects and story time to go kits that patrons could request. Um, st staff developed online programs like virtual D&D programs, virtual writing groups, and virtual film discussions. They also participated in cattle-wide virtual programming like story times, trivia, recipe swap, escape rooms, and coding programs all online. We had to reimagine how to provide the services that we had previously provided in person, and staff did an excellent job working through the kinks and creating quality content that met our patron needs. We eventually introduced computer access by appointment, although um, most were walk-ins at South Downtown, and um, Foster, we didn't, weren't able to provide that service. Um, through this service, we were able to have patrons in, library, in the library and provide them with access to technology. Um, despite all these great services, staff really missed our patrons. We missed seeing them every day, so it was hard to keep staff morale up because that was our biggest loss in 2020 is not being able to see our patrons. And we know that there's some that we probably will never see again, and, and it's, it's really sad. Um, we worried about them, we missed them, um, and, and like I said, it was one of the hardest things of 2020 is not being able to see our patrons in person. Um, we didn't lack for work when the library was empty. We had plenty to do. We worked on projects that we didn't, wouldn't normally have time to do. Um, we completed an inventory of all three branches and ensured that the collection is in good condition with accurate records. We reorganized our supplies um, so that they were more accessible and we reduced uh, over-purchasing. At downtown, we built a stage in the children's area with grant money we received in 2019, and it'll serve as a play space for kids and a stage for performers. We rearranged the children's area to accommodate the stage and a play space. We also purchased new shelving unit to highlight our new children's book collection. We also uh, moved other parts of the collection to make them more user friendly at downtown. At South, we moved parts of the collection too. We did lots of moving <laughs> of the collection <laughs> to make them more accessible and user friendly. Um, and we took two, shel two units of shelves and transferred them downtown and used them there because they would be of better use there. And it expanded our children's space to make it a little bit bigger. Um, Julian Van Dyke, a lo local artist, installed a bunch of art at South Lansing and it's absolutely beautiful. Yes, patrons and staff were thrilled with it and it's, it really makes a difference in the space. Um, and although I did not get to Foster until January 2021, if you guys go to Foster, you'll now find it much changed. We did a lot of work on it. Um, uh, and it's uh, a bright and inviting and welcoming library um, with a collection that fits the space. Um, and as Scott mentioned, we're also working on what we are now calling the Foster Labs and staff are currently painting it so, um, and putting a lot of energy and time into it. So it's gonna be great. Um, we also maintain some important partnerships. We partnered with the Parks and Rec um, delivering books and activities to the learning labs at Foster every week. We also worked with the Girl Scouts Outreach to get kits to the girls so they could participate um, in Girl Scouts from home. Um, we also created virtual content for uh, events like Virtual Baby Fair and the ISD Special Education Fall Fair. Staff reached out to schools and preschools and provided uh, virtual visits. Um, and one of the best things uh, to come out of the pandemic pandemic was our partnership with the Lansing School District um, through the Student Success Initiative, which gives a library card to every student at Lansing School District. So they have access to our digital content and, content and physical items, physical collection. Um, so, but the very best thing that came out of the pandemic, if anything like wonderful could come out of the pandemic, was the impact that we made on our patrons. And I have a couple of stories that um, I ended up keeping a file of all the stories and all the comments that we got from our patrons. So I'm just gonna read a couple. Um, one patron said, I really appreciate all you have done for my children and 
I, it's been hard financially during quarantine this year, and as a single mother, it got very difficult to make any payments to anything besides rent and food. But what you did is more than appreciated and helps me out more than you know. Reading movies is how we are all surviving all of this. Again, thank you for all you guys do at the library and for our community. Um, and also, uh, I just want to say a giant thank you to Cattle for the absolute gift you have been to my family during this pandemic. Our foster library pickups have been, become a weekly outing we all look forward to in my house. We loved the library before, but you all have gone over the top to keep us connected and reading in this pandemic. Your story times to go are, su are such a special time for me and my little guys. My four-year-old can't even wait until we get home to open the bags. I hope you all know how much you matter and what a gift you are to the community. Thank you. And um, one of my favorites is, what would we do without our libraries or our librarians? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, um, and that's all I have. Well, thank you. That's quite a bit of information. I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, do we have questions? Councilmember Wood. Just a couple of quick questions. Now, um, is library fully open for access in all the branches? It is. And that was, um, the lighting is probably good in here, so you can't see the amount of gray hair that I have built <laughs> up in, in the past year. But I mean, that was something that we truly struggled with. As Melissa said, you're balancing staff safety with the safety of the public. And, and so we took kind of a slow and cautious approach. It was curb and door side, then what do we need to come in, public computers, and then um, open to the public. And then with the uh, MDHHS guidelines uh, going away, fully open to the public as of June, so. Okay, thank you. The next is um, with the hot spots. How long are um, patrons allowed to have the hot spots for? They're allowed to have them for two weeks, unless they're there. And then, if you want them longer, you can check to see if there's a hold queue. There probably is a, a hold queue for those. But one of the things that we're working on is getting some specifically for students as well. So we have uh, Melissa mentioned the Student Success Initiative. We have some uh, working with specific schools um, where there is a need for students with home internet access issues to have these extended loan hotspots that could go out for the entire school year as well. Okay. And then are there any, and, and again, because we've been through the pandemic, but are there any new things that you're loaning out? I know each year <laughs> you come with different things that you've created to be able to loan out. So I'm, ju I'm just wondering if there's anything new um, yeah. added to that. The yeah, there, so we did add new technology like the Chromebooks and, and the iPads. Um, uh, we haven't necessarily expanded it um, beyond like the musical instruments and some of the other things that we have. Probably the most popular item since coming out of the, the pandemic and as things become more open is we circulate American Girl dolls. And there's a whole collection of those, and, and you could not imagine how popular uh, those are with our collection. But for that one, we, we mainly used the time to replace the ones that we needed to replace, and then um, probably this year and then in the next year, add new items as well. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Garza. Thank you. Good to see you guys again. Um, now, I, I guess I just want to jump on with the 50, the, the hot spots that you have. Mm -hmm. Are those just utilize in the Lansing area? Are they like uh, Verizon, at and I mean, are there different spots in the city where they don't work as well? There are. So what we did is uh, we had a group of staff who went through and, and, and tested each uh, provider. Um, and, and they used library services for each. So, you know, they would go into specific area on Verizon, T-Mobile, or Sprint, try to um, download an ebook, try to download an audiobook, try to stream some of our content, just kind of how people would use it if they were using library services. And we tried to match it for that. So if someone goes into our, our and we try to help people with that as well too. So if someone wants to know um, what would be the best for their area, they can reach out to us and do that. Otherwise, if they know, you know, Verizon works in my area, they can, they can uh, request one of the Verizon hotspots as well too. Okay, great. Um, now, the 50 small businesses, the grant that you received, mm -hmm. is that just, is that the Ingham County area? Is that just strictly Lansing? We worked with the SBDC, so the Small Business Development Center. Um, it was primarily Lansing, but we did have some uh, businesses that were outside of Lansing as well, too. It was a combination of um, bricks and mortar stores, but also um, some that were at home businesses as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Vice President Hussein. 
if, if I missed it, I do apologize. First of all, thanks for being here and all the incredible work you guys do for the CADL. Um, if I missed it, I apologize. One of the things that we hear, we, we have fantastic groups, obviously you guys know this, and the city of Lansing doing some really incredible work. And one of the things that they sometimes struggle with is meeting space. Uh, and so I know you have uh, public meeting rooms and things of that nature uh, that are part of your branches. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, how do you need to be, do you need to be a card holder? What's capacity? How do we apply? How do we get into those meeting spaces? Sure. So we are bringing those back. Um, that's probably one of the most requested services mm -hmm. outside of just normally using the library. Um, we're looking to, to bring those back in the fall of this year. So starting in September, we're going back to our regular open hours and then bringing back a lot of our other services um, like booking meeting rooms uh, and for that you do need a library card uh, to book those meeting rooms and then um, you just contact your local library and they would actually walk you through the entire process okay and the only reason I know about those meeting rooms is that <laughs> we actually meet uh, Melissa and myself as part of uh, the Lansing Harmony Celebration Steering Committee so uh, take off the three uh, hats in terms of head librarian uh, <laughs> she's also a rock star in our steering committee and she puts is, together yeah. one heck of a yeah. we have a lot of components that are part of that celebration yeah. but she is like her and Meredith Johnson well, fully you know move the kids part um, for it and they're incredible if, if you remember when we would come in the past it would be a whole crew of us yep. and it could only be one Melissa Cole to be able <laughs> that's to right, that's right. libraries so. um, and then the other piece is I just wanted to say thank you um, to you too I don't know that people um, are um, clear on, on how close they were to losing their South Lansing Library. Um, and there was a lot of work done behind the curtain. I want to thank uh, Councilman Garza as well. Uh, he advocated like I haven't seen anybody advocate uh, in order to keep that in South Lansing. I think you two understood, no matter who the messenger was, that you know it might just not work out. You all said it has to work out. Yep. Um, a library in that space uh, that was accessible um, to all, um, and again, um, one that was accessible to um, groups of people that truly need those services to help scaffold them for them, uh, you know, from their circumstances. You guys were uh, unequivocating. It, it, yeah. We're going to stay here. We need to stay here. And you did whatever you had to do uh, to make that happen. So I wanted to thank publicly you all, you. Uh, as well as Councilman Garza, for making that happen. Thank you. Let me thank you for your support. <clears throat> Councilmember Dunbar. Thank you. I just really want to harken back to what you said earlier about the forgiving the fines because it's huge. It is. It is really huge. I mean, when we when we look at what I would call the high cost of being poor and the 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 fines and fees that we tax people with who are the least able to to handle that and I'm so thrilled that you actually did a hotspot map and said, "Okay, well a lot of these are from neighborhoods where they don't even have a primary mode of transportation mm -hmm. outside of, you know." So I just I think that that's just very very commendable for you to have taken that ran with it and, and then continue with that empathy. Thank you. Thank you. And it, it's important to look at those things and say, like, is there a better way of doing business rather than basically people are already paying with their tax dollars for library service. Why should they be charged again if there's a better way that we can get those items back? And yeah. and while it was a revenue stream, um, it should not be have been a revenue stream. And so we were able to cut back some of our things because it was important for us that library access for everyone regardless of whether you could afford to pay your fines or you couldn't thank you very much all right well thank you I'm an avid user of your digital services so I appreciate the services cattle brings to this community but uh, for everything you did during a pandemic I know countless parents were served by the resources and services you provided so thank you for being here tonight thanks for everything you did over the last year thank you Next up is a resolution uh, reappointing 19 individuals to various boards and commissions. Um, and I'm pulling it up here on my screen. Uh, we are looking at Ronald Wilson on the Board of Public Service, Barbara Lawrence and Stephen Purchase on the Board of Fire Commissioners, Holly McDermott on the Board of Police Commissioners, Michael Redding on the Board of Review, uh, Lisa Speaker on the EOCC, the Elected Officers Compensation Commission, excuse me, Daniel Barclay on the Electrical Board, Curtis Sonnenberg on the Historic District Commission. Uh, for LEPFO, we're looking at Charles Mickens and Price Dobernick. For the Local Development Finance Authority, Benjamin Bakken. For the Michigan Avenue Corridor Improvement Authority Board of Directors, Scott Gillespie and Yvette Collins. For the Park Board, Mike Dembrowski and Nate Scramlin. For the Capital Area Transit Authority Board, Derek Milo and Nathan Triplett. For the Planning Board, Farhan Bhatti and John Ruge. And that's... Rug, excuse me. And those are the 19 reappointments that are being considered. Mr. Vice President. 
Sure. I would move the uh, resolution uh, for these reappointments. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Councilmember, Vice President Hussein. Yeah, just very quickly. You know, when we bring people in uh, for these types of appointments, obviously initially, um, th there's this recognition, right, of the work that they've done. Um, it's us, um, you know, recognizing, kind of awarding that work, um, recognizing the fact that they're going to be, you know, that we believe they'll be incredible uh, assets to these respective boards. And then when we don't bring them in, um, I almost feel like sometimes we don't, we kind of miss the opportunity uh, to underscore their service, to thank them for the work that they have actually done as part of. Uh, or as a member of those respective bodies. So I just want to, if anybody um, that is being reappointed is listening, I just want you all to know um, that we recognize the work you all do. Um, we know you are volunteers, um, the packets that you have to uh, you know, go through and, and the, uh, the meetings that you have to make and the emails that you have to respond to and the public engagement that you're a part of. Um, sometimes that we know it's incredibly thankless, uh, but we certainly um, appreciate your work. And if we could, uh, as an example, recognize each one of you for the, for the respective work you do on these boards as part of resolutions of recognition or whatever what have you um you know we would certainly do that but again i just want to it's just so unceremonious but i know these people are doing great work so i want to um i wanted to just take the opportunity to thank folks thank you mr vice president any further discussion council member dunbar thank you um <clears throat> i realize the intent is to move this as a as a whole um but i do i do have a concern with one of the appointments, reappointments. So could we move to separate? Um, because I, I still firmly hold the belief that, um, that we should not have um, family members serving on boards at which, um, in, in a department where their family member is working. And I fully get that at this point now, um, this father is no longer, he's retired, but there is an active litigation that names this person. Um, and then we're putting their son back on the board in the office where that litigation is currently alive. So I would move to separate out that particular appointment to the fire board. Who is it? It's Stephen Purchase. Okay, there's been a motion before us to separate that question. Ms. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Spadafore? No. Councilmember Hussein? Yes. Councilmember Wood? No. Councilmember Garza? Yes. Councilmember Jackson? Yes. Councilmember Betts? Yes. Councilmember Dunbar? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, first up are the 18 appointments minus Stephen Purchase. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Next item is the appointment, the reappointment of Stephen Purchase to the Board of Fire Commissioners with a term to expire June 30th, 2025. Um, is there any discussion? Oh, I'm sorry, we'll need a, I guess the motion still applies. Go for it. Oh, they can't hear you, Mr. Jackson. That's right. You're muted. Um, I would propose that we table it so that council members can get more information about the proposed conflict and understand what's going on. Motion table is not debatable. Would the clerk please call the All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Uh, the ayes have it. Uh, the, oppo the nays have it. The motion will not be tabled. Uh, we'll continue discussion. Council Member Wood. Um, do we have a motion on the floor to? Yes. Uh, so who's made the motion? Oh, I was carrying it forward. Uh, Mr. Vice President, will you make the motion to approve Mr. Purchase? So moved. Now we do. Okay. Um, now speaking to the motion, um, you know, we had Mr. Purchase, um, who has been representing on the board uh, for um, this, in, for his term, uh, we even had him into the Public Safety Committee talking about the new rules uh, that were we just recently approved for um, the Fire Board. I don't see any reason why um, 
that we can't move forward with this appointment, along with the fact that the, the board of uh, commissioners has nothing to do with the lawsuit um, and it's not named in the lawsuit. So with that, I will be supporting his appointment. Thank you, Council Member Wood. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Next item on our agenda is a resolution um, that is Nunc Pro Tunc action based on COVID impact in 2020. Um, recall back that when we disappeared from uh, in-person meetings 483 days ago, we passed resolution 2020-55 to provide for our meetings to be virtual. And in that resolution, it stated that after the state of emergency declaration is ended, each council member shall ratify their vote on every action taken during the period of time when meetings were held virtually. This resolution does that and would ratify every vote taken between March 16th and June 21st, 2021 virtually um, as valid and the, the vote that was cast by individual council members. It's kind of a belts and suspenders thing just in case um, the OMA changes were deemed not um, appropriate. So is there anyone that has any questions on this? Uh, Mr. Vice President, would I like to take a motion and then we have some questions? So moved. Moved by the Vice President, uh, Council Member Jackson. Oh, I wanna change my vote on something. Nope. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm good then. I would move to expel Brian Jackson from. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, any question? Any further discussion? All right. I want to thank the city attorney's office and Sherry for keeping this on top of mind um, and making sure this worked out for us. So, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? It better be unanimous. All right. Motion carries unanimously. Next item on the agenda. I'm going to give Lisa just a second to head down to the table. Um, we have a charter amendment, Article 2, Chapter 2, Sections 2-205 through 206, uh, for the method of election, uh, moving us to what is com colloquially, colloquially referred to as ranked choice voting. And then Item G is another charter amendment for Sections 2-201, 203, 204, and 206, which would eliminate the primary election. Um, it's my understanding that after consulting with others at the Attorney General's office, it was advised that that also be part of this, this conversation. So, Lisa, I'll turn it over to you to discuss the latest drafts that sit before us. Thank you. So what you should, be ha what you should have before you is draft um, dated 7-12 of 2021. Um, I'll first address the changes that I made to the ranked choice voting resolution. Um, the changes made, as you mentioned, President Spadafor, were um, as part of some informal discussion and feedback that we received from um, a member of the Attorney General's office. Uh, he made it very clear that the feedback that he was providing was part of the service that he provides to municipalities. He cannot speak for the AG's office as a whole, but he did provide some very helpful comments. Um, one of the major changes is that we addressed um, section 2-205 sub two, which speaks um, directly to the election of at-large members of city council. If you recall, the last time we spoke about ranked choice voting, there were some questions from this body as to whether it applied to at-large members and how it would affect those at-large elections. So this subsection deals with that. The other change that was made um, was a request of another council member to specify that the majority is greater than 50% rather than just saying a majority. And the only other change um, is in the ballot question itself. As you, as you likely know, the ballot question is limited to 100 words. Those 100 words include, shall this amendment be adopted at the end, which is four words that I was not personally expecting to be counted. So I had to eliminate um, something from the prior draft which was in the parentheses of the ballot question. The, the parentheses used to say, as soon as the city acquires voting machine equipment approved by the city election commission to implement this amendment. And so I just uh, struck out to implement this amendment. So those were the major changes on the rank choice. Um, as part of the conversation with uh, Mr. Elworth of the Attorney General's office, he reminded me that the primary election is mentioned in multiple places in the charter. And if the idea of ranked choice voting is to eliminate a primary election, 
then there should be a separate ballot question that eliminates mention of a primary election throughout the charter. And that's what this ballot proposal and resolution does. Um, critically, the language in the ballot questions tie together. So if one passes and the other doesn't, then neither are implemented. If both pass, then they're implemented um, as kind of discussed in the resolution. Um, so with that, I'll say that those were the major changes. I'm happy to take any questions, concerns, comments. Uh, Mr. Vice President, did you make a motion? I can't remember for the life of me. Yes. Okay, there's a motion before us. So is there any discussion on these items? None? Councilmember Garza. And, and you might have just answered it. Sorry, I was trying to look through all the, the pages that you submitted. Um, Mr. DeLine, he spoke earlier and he mentioned that this is just uh, uh, to change an amendment uh, for, or I'm sorry, to uh, um, change an ordinance so that it can be put on the ballot to be voted. So we wouldn't be voting tonight to implement this for city council. This would just be approving it to allow the voters to vote. That's correct. Yes, this would be to a proposal for the ballot to change the city charter, okay. but for the electors to make that decision. Great. All right. Thank you. Uh, council member Jackson. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. City Attorney. So yes, it would be the November election. November. Yep. Uh, Councilmember Jackson, sorry to interrupt. Thank you. Just a, um, a little clarification on the conversation to require that second um, language to amend when the intent is clearly to add it and by adding it would, I mean, did we, do we have to do that? Obviously we do because you're doing it, but just a little more info about why we have to do the, eliminate the primary election. Why can't it just be like one thing if the people say yes, that's the intent, and therefore take out the mention of the, the invalidated system. Sure. Well, there's um, a number of sections of the charter that mention a primary election. And so just due to the sheer number of articles and sections that we were addressing with the primary, it was viewed as, you know, from my perspective, cumbersome and a little bit confusing to try to throw it all into one. And it in my opinion, um, and in discussions, again, informally with the Attorney General's office, was cleaner to separate it out, specifically because while ranked choice voting does, in practice, eliminate a primary election, it's not necessarily the main purpose, and so that's why we separated them. Uh, Jim, did you want to add anything? Just, <clears throat> Lisa's worked with George Elworth, who's in the Attorney General's office for a long time, and under the Home Rule Cities Act, uh, charter amendments are spelled out and the procedures are spelled out, and one of the procedures is to go to the governor for approval. Now, right now, this is a five-vote item. If you, if you go to the governor's office for approval, which will eventually happen and it gets sent back, then it's a, it becomes a six-vote item. Um, the governor is only going to act generally if the attorney general says yes. So we listen to the attorney general is basically the answer to that. And I think Lisa made a very good point. This was informal comments from somebody who works at the attorney general's office, not input from the attorney general's office. I may have misstated that at the front end of this. Yep, go ahead, Jeremy. Uh, Councilmember Garza. All right, thanks, Council President. So I did hear, speaking back with uh, Mr. DeLine, he mentioned that if this does get approved, he's going to get out there and work the messaging. Now, is there any, um, if this does get approved and, and, and it comes back from the governor and we pass a six vote and it gets approved, is there going to, what's, what's the city's uh, method on getting the message out to, uh, to the voters of how this new voting is going to be implemented in the city? Um, I don't know if that's a question for the city attorney's office. My guess would be that's more of a question for the city clerk and how ballot proposals are um, announced and explained. Um, our role is simply the legal aspect of drafting the, the ballot proposal itself. And we have a ballot proposal on the May, oh, on the August election that's coming up as well um, related to uh, the millage. So we, we did that this time around, so we'll do the same process next time around if this gets that far. We do not have a motion before us, um, so I will ask the Vice President to make a motion on item F. So moved. All right, now we have item F before us. Uh, we'll just count all that discussion as part of that one. 
Uh, Mr. Vice President. Yeah, so this, is, this has been a really tough one for me. Um, I've had a lot of really good conversations with Jim DeLine, uh, Hugh McNichol, Ryan Smith. There's a number of advocates out there uh, that are working on this, Max Donovan, and we certainly appreciate all of, you, all of your work. Um, it, I, I, I struggle with this for a few reasons. Number one, I struggle with uh, some of the language in the resolution. If you look at the second and third whereas, is, um, it reads as, it says, whereas it has been determined by, um, by whom, Right? Um, I think the implication is that by us and that we believe this method to be, be superior, but in any event, it's been determined by, uh, or determined, sorry, that the current methods of election codified by charter contribute to insufficient choice and participation for residents. And then the third is where it's been determined that other methods of election can be more efficient while providing citizens with a superior range of options. Again, I think the implication is that we believe that this voting method uh, is superior um, and that we're suggesting a yes vote based on a necessity. I'm just not, I'm just not there yet. Um, I'm. I'm generally um, supportive of putting this before people if they have um, the necessary, the requisite information to vote uh, in a meaningful and purposeful way. Um, but I certainly don't want to apply as if I, as uh, an elected in the city of Lansing, am suggesting that this is a superior method. Um, candidly, um, I even spoke to Jim DeLine at length uh, not too long ago, and I shared some of my concerns. And, and with all due respect to Jim, he couldn't even beat back uh, a number of my concerns. We talked a little bit about um, you know, some of the, even some of the data that he provided uh, to us today, but obviously we've had an election uh, in the city of New York since, uh, which is a mayoral primary, and they had a number of issues. Uh, and one of the issues um, was concern and frustration regarding um, voters and the fact that precinct workers weren't even able to truly help guide them through the process. They, they weren't really in the know, they were frustrated, created a number of issues. Uh, we know that Maine, uh, back in 2016, I believe, became the first state uh, to allow for this in federal elections. Uh, and since then, there have been a number of um, nonpartisan objective polls uh, that have been put out. And they have seen that, although it passed substantially in the state of Maine, um, they have seen voter satisfaction go way down, voter confidence go way down. Um, the, the, the weight in lines have gone way up. Frustration at polling centers have went up. Um, if you look at what they're doing in Alaska, which is also going, they're gonna implement this statewide. Um, I think they're a little closer. This deals with federal elections, obviously, um, but they're not getting rid of the primary. What they're actually doing is using, um, I believe, ranked choice voting through the primary, or, or that might be work in reverse, actually. It might be an open um, primary, and then they might be using ranked choice voting after that. The reason why those types of things um, are a little bit more, I think, appealing to me is that if you saw, as an example, what just took place um, with regards to the uh, mayoral, uh, campaign, um, I'm sorry, the mayoral forum, um, and, and maybe even some of these more neighborhood specific forums for our at large and for our ward reps, the fields are so crowded, it has been really difficult to separate, um, you know, and, and to distinguish between candidates. Uh, they're given one to two minutes, uh, because again, the, the, um, the, the forum is so crowded. Um, if you're talking about door knocking, if you're talking about mailers, if you're talking about calls, if you're talking, it's difficult to really distinguish one person from another because you can't get deep into the issues. Um, and I think that's one of the purposes of primary serves, um, is to make sure that everybody has an opportunity, but then truly to separate those folks that are serious candidates with the requisite experience uh, from the others, and then really have a meaningful couple months before that uh, general to dig deep into the issues and, and determine who is really gonna be able to guide the city forward. So, so I don't wanna pass something that implies that I am at you know, at this place that I think this is a superior uh, election method because I'm just not there. Um, that being said, it, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, because I was thinking and reading and as you were talking, this, this isn't our only bite at the apple. This does come back, is that correct? Or no? This goes to the AG. This after this, uh, you go oh, Jim, you're on mute. You're yeah. at council. Uh, so if council adopts it, it goes to the AG yeah. for uh, submission to the governor gets placed on the ballot. Oh, okay, so it doesn't, okay. So it's that procedure. We did an informal review with the AG at this okay. point. As, as, as for me, as somebody that teaches democracy, access to government, I'm concerned by a number of things that I'm seeing play out um, in the country. Um, again, this is a very unproven uh, election method, uh, if you will, and what we're actually seeing is the reverse of the, of the intention. We're actually seeing voters disenfranchised, particularly our senior voters. And that's very, very concerning to me when they experience that type of voter frustration and then they're just throwing their hands up and saying, I'm not gonna vote. So I'm just, I'm really concerned. Um, okay, those are my comments for now, thanks. Councilmember Dunbar, then Councilmember Jackson. Thank you. <clears throat> I did read the, the stories from New York and it's concerning. Um, I was wondering if you could 
um, expound on why you thought that maybe there would be more lines at the polls with this? Or, because I, I was thinking that with the amount of absentee push that we are doing right now, that may, that wouldn't be the case. But what are you what are you hearing? So out of so out of Maine, there's been quite a bit of study, and what they've said is that for each, they they actually have it down to a second and minute. So they they found that for each actual race that people are voting for, it has actually expanded the time by so much. So what I'm saying is that the people that are going there are taking longer to vote, and and so that is actually increasing wait times for folks. Um, I don't know how that interfaces with this push for absentee. I don't know what that does. Um, I'm just saying that's what they're saying. All set, Kathy? Yeah. Councilmember Jackson? Thank you. A few things that I guess I'm not officially going to propose this amendment, but maybe we strike the first three words and it starts, whereas the current methods of elections codified by Charbert may contribute to insufficient, and with the second one starting at, whereas other methods of election may be more, so it takes out, you know, our stamp of approval, and it still lets the people vote, because I think that is one of the most serious things that we can consider as council, because all we're saying is people vote. We're not saying we support it or not, um, I guess one way not to support it would be to not let the people vote, but that's, you know, everybody has their choices. Um, as far as having a crowded field, I think that ranked choice voting goes more favorably for that because one, it allows constituents more time all the way until November to really hear everybody. Um, because if you eliminate some people at the beginning and it's like, oh, I wish you came, to, I wish I met you before, or my person I wanted that I voted for in the primary is a big douchebag now, and I want to vote, I wish I voted for you in the past, or whatever it is. So it actually allows everybody the whole time to campaign and to get to know people and people to get to know them. Um, you know, save money, whatever, that's not the main focus, but it is something also. But the main focus should be let the people vote. So I think, I mean, it, it would be a pretty easy fix. I don't want to change anything, but if we did that, it could take, maybe you would vote for it. Um, but I'll be supporting it. Thank you, Councilmember Jackson. C Councilmember Garza? All right, thank you. So I agree. I think the people should be able to decide, you know, not us, obviously, but the people should take it to the ballot. Now, in order to get it to the ballot, if this doesn't pass, is there, there's probably still not enough time to go and get the signatures to take it to the ballot for this year, this November, correct? Anybody? What was your question, Councilman Garza? I think I was just trying to figure it out. So, I, I agree. It should be up to a vote by the people. But what I'm, what I guess, what I'm asking is, is it too late now for them to get a ballot initiative, like get the signatures and have it still in time for the November? I'm looking at the clerk, who is not. He's looking at his calendar next. <laughs> it's probably pretty tight for November. Yeah, you got to get it on. You got to get it to us by August 9th is the deadline to get something on the ballot. Is that correct? Oh, and we're a couple weeks before August 9th. The answer is no. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. We do, um, we have a suggestion of an amendment, but not a formal amendment. And Sherry's pointing out to me, too, we have another meeting before. We have to prove it on the 9th of August, which we have a meeting on that day, too. So if, there, if you want to table this for the next time and, and take a look at the language, we can entertain that possibility as well. Well, I guess I would ask, I mean, I don't know if Councilmember Hussein is comfortable answering, would that change your mind if we did it? Because that's really only deleting three or four words. Can you, can you repeat the language, please? All right, so on your first paragraph, it would say, where is the current methods of election codified by the charter may contribute to insufficient choice and participation for residents? That's actually the second whereas. Okay, yeah, the second whereas. But the first one you're concerned about. And the second one you're concerned about, the third whereas, whereas other methods of election may be more efficient while providing citizens with a superior range of options. What if we put, um, I would be more comfortable if we said whereas it has been argued that the current methods of election codified by charter. And, and I would support that, and I think it would still move the process um, to the AG and, and ultimately get it on the ballot. Any change to the third whereas? It would be the same, right? Yeah. So. Okay. 
you still want the um, charter may contribute and other methods of election may be more efficient his may suggestions no so mine is we'll have printed copies of this for you all at council yeah. when we get there <laughs> no just that it has been argued that other methods of election could be can be more efficient while providing citizens citizens with a superior range of options or am i not going further enough far enough into that whereas the second response? one yeah so change it to where it has been argued that the current methods of election codified by charter may contribute okay so add yeah. the may there yeah. the third whereas whereas it has been argued that other methods of election can be or maybe maybe so maybe yeah. so put the maybe in there too okay okay we have a amendment from a council member jackson all those in favor of the amend uh, are we clear what it is i want to make sure everyone understands we're voting on the amendment to the Second and third, whereas is to ambiguitize the language a little bit. All right. And this is in the first resolution. First resolution. Yep, that will amend 2 205 and 2 206 regarding the methods of election. It's not, we're not changing, we're not changing we the. We haven't discussed the second, which speaks to the primary. Okay. All right. So, all those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next is the amendment, the actual resolution in front of us. We will return to discussion. Is there any further discussion on this item? I will say I'm a little bit dubious of this method of voting uh, myself. I've spent some time, uh, as Vice President Hussein has, researching it. Um, I think we have some uh, sort of a de facto ranked choice voting in the city of Lansing through our primary and general system, whereby the choices are narrowed down. Um, but that being said, I was here, I, I, I'm very interested in what the people have to say so I will be supporting this after the discussion tonight okay all those in favor please say aye aye all opposed aye. motion carries next item is item G the charter amendment for dealing with elimination of the primary election uh, mr. vice president uh, I would move the resolution. motion has been made um, I don't see much need for further discussion. These are tie barred to some extent. So if there is other discussion, please speak now or do we want to do we want to make the amendments to the whereas? Well, if they want to, they have the, oh, the yeah. second and third are the same whereas. Yeah. I would entertain a motion to amend those whereas is from Councilmember Betts. Thank you, Councilmember Betts. Uh, Sherry, you've got the changes. Okay. Um, all those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Ayes have it. Next up is the motion before us, which is approval of item G. Any further discussion? Seeing none, if the clerk would, I'm sorry, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. All those in favor? Aye. There you go. Uh, most, the, eye, the eyes have it, and I do want to thank Lisa. Um, I know this was brought to us by others, and a lot of work went into the front end, but Lisa in the city attorney's office has spent a lot of time making sure that if this does make it to the, city, the Attorney General's office that we have at least crossed as many T's and dotted as many I's as possible. So thank you very much, Lisa. Next item on our agenda is a closed session. Mr. Vice President. Sure. Uh, pursuant to MCL 15.268 and MCL 15.268, sorry, Section C and E of the Open Meetings Act, I hereby move that we recess in a closed session for strategy and negotiation sessions connected with the negotiation of the memorandum of understanding between the city of Lansing and the Teamsters 243 as requested by the city and to discuss the active litigation, city of Lansing, Michigan versus Purdue Pharma LP uh, et al. That is a proper motion. It will require a roll call vote and six members voting in the affirmative. Would the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Hussein. Yes. Council Member Spadafore. Yes. Steve. Council Member Dunbar. Steve. Council Member Wood. Yes. Councilmember Garza? Yes. Councilmember Jackson? No. Councilmember Betts? Yes. Motion carries six one. You can't come with us then, Brian. Uh, for those members of the public, we will recess to closed session. We will come back out here uh, to adopt the resolutions potentially and then adjourn for city council. Thank you.
Push. Do you want me to just push it all the way to attorney? Out of committee. Six forty six and the committee is back from closed session. I lost another one. So I'd like to be able to go back in. Oh, you lost two. I lost two. All right. We're gonna stand at ease. You can want them all here. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna stand at ease while I wait for uh
two members that walked out. All right, we are back to order, yeah, right? Yes, okay. Uh, next item on our agenda is item H, a resolution for the Teamsters 243 Supervisory Memorandum of Understanding. Mr. Vice President. Sure, so what we have uh, before us is, sorry, a resolution for the memorand Memorandum of Understanding. I can't talk after that closed session. Um, it does um, reflect a 2% wage increase. This would be retroactive. Uh, to February 1st, 2021, it would be effective for the duration of the CBA uh, that is in place, which would, uh, I believe, runs through January 31st uh, of next year. Uh, this was built in the fiscal year 2022 budget that we approved at the end of May. With that said, I would move the resolution. Okay. All those, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Vice President, item I. Sure. So the bones of this are the exact same. Again, it's a 2% wage increase, retroactive. Uh, back to February 1st, 2021. Uh, that being said, I would move the resolution. Very good. The clerical uh, resolution of MOU is before us. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. With that, at 649, the Committee of the Whole is adjourned.